terrorism. I, I helped to create the threat in the West. And that's why I'm dedicating myself to pulling that back. And I'm very regretful for that. People that I trained in Hezbo Tahrir went on to become terrorists. One of them took flying lessons. And this is just a fact of the history of the what growth of Islamist parties in the UK. But you've gone what, from one extremist position to another extremist position. You've just said that the Prophet had, uh, was a civil leader as if he didn't have anything to do with Islam. Oh, the Prophet didn't have anything. He didn't bring Islam to the political arena at all. Oh my God. You know, it, it's absolutely ridiculous, this idea. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. That you can't be. Why do, why do we not allow ourselves the right to bring our spirituality to the table of the political discourse? Why do we deny ourselves the right to bring our faith, our, our guidance, our, our, what we can offer to the 21st century? Why do we believe there's okay. this wonderful Western yeah, political Majid, model that nobody has anything for the we Majid, can't now have come back you, on that, you keep mixing the two points of Muslims engaging in politics without coming with an agenda and those who have politicised Islam. What we're talking about here is those who have politicised Islam. Okay, so I'm going to the, go to the gentleman in the third row. You, sir. Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Assad al-Assad. I'm from Syria. Uh, speaking about countries that embrace Islam or Islamic Sharia as the major source of their constitutions, such as Saudi Arabia and Iran that embrace Islam as their, an ideology for the country. Can't we take these an example of a threat to the West? And if we think about it in a different way, why is Iran perceived as a threat while Saudi Arabia is not? Thank you. Who would like to take that? Well, I think that that's what, we call, what, what uh, actually uh, Richard Haas called democratic exceptionalism. He was the former US ambassador. And ultimately, this, that uh, democratic exceptionalism, we accept this one and we don't accept that one, or we like this one, perhaps that one. And it's tinkering. That, you know, it's the game play that unfortunately goes on. I think the point that this evening, and why I want you to reject this motion, is that if we don't make room in the political arena for those who want to have a political discourse based upon their faith, not only um, is this non-democratic, not only is this against the, dem the democratic principles of the West that you know, we want to espouse, we exclude them at our own expense. We have to find room, because the simple fact is, as Graham, Graham Fuller of the CIA said, the simple fact is, is that political Islam, defined broadly as the belief that the Quran and the Hadith have something important to say about the way society and governance should be ordered, remains today the most powerful ideological force in that part of the world. You like the CIA, don't you? Well, I just think, you know, <laughs> the, 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 these guys... a lot from them. These guys, at the end of the day, are meant to go out there... No, seriously. These guys are meant to go out there and find out who are the threats to the West. These guys are there looking for the bad guys, looking for the threats. And at the end of the day, there are bad guys of course there. there's bad guys in the world. Yeah. These guys are looking out there, looking for the threats to the, to the West. And do you know what? They say that political Islam isn't actually a threat. Well, imagine, imagine, we're not no. saying that there aren't bad guys. We're yeah. saying the bad guys are a minority of Islamists and the majority of Islamists are, are not Please give me the examples. The majority of the brotherhood that we've just been speaking about, you don't agree with them and you're not here to defend them. I find that quite amusing because I think you in should a be sitting in here. In a democratic sure. system, people have... I hope in the future the we can work together. Can you, can you let yeah. him reply? Yeah. You made a point. Did you have something yes, to say? Yes, in a democratic system, people have the right to have illiberal views. The Republican Party in America has strong Christian influences. They've supported torture over the last eight years of the Bush administration. They've, they've been against equal they rights were, for... They, equal were, they, rights would, they for would take issue with that. No, well, it's, no, it's certainly it's true. They I mean, there's been a lot of document. I agree they're, with they're, against, they're yep. against equal rights for gays, so yep. on and so yep. forth. That's illiberal. That doesn't mean we should ban Republicans from participating. No, no, it doesn't Shari. mean Republicans are a threat to Shari. the West. I, I was the first to stand up <laughs> in the UK to oppose banning even Hezbo Tahrir, which is why I corrected Tim in his introduction. Sorry about that. But it's because I agree with you. They have the right to have illiberal views. That doesn't mean we consider those views a problem. Of course they're a problem. We don't ban them. We deal with them through debates such as this to expose what they really believe in. I was quoted in Parliament by Gordon Brown, the Prime Minister of the UK, okay. when asked about why he hasn't banned Hizb al-Tahrir. He said because Majid Nawaz came out being a member on their leadership and said we shouldn't ban them. That was my contribution to not banning Islamists in the UK. I agree that they should not be banned, but they should be exposed. They are a problem. Okay, Illiberal right. views are a problem, true or not? We're going to take a question from the gentleman in the fourth row there. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. My name is Daniel from New York City. Uh, I'd like to speak very specifically about a threat. Do you believe that Iran's nuclear aspirations and its support, economic and military support, for organiz organizations such as Hamas and Hezbollah pose not only a threat to democracies in the Middle East, such as Israel, but also the Middle Eastern stability? Thank Sa you. Sarah Joseph. I think that there are nations out there who, you know, 
we, we, we don't like their politics. North Korea is perhaps another one. Nobody asked a specific question about Iran. About Iran. Mm -hmm. Do I think that they're a threat? No, actually, I don't think that they're a threat. I think that they are ultimately um, a government that we can, we can, we can uh, make very scary stories about. Um, and we can say that they're illiberal. But actually, if you look at... Um, many people uh, that's coming out of Iran, no, I don't think that they're a threat, a substantive threat to the West. I really and truly don't. We might put them in our axis of evil. We might say, oh, you know, let's go into Iraq, and then let's go into Iran. But, you know, who's more of a threat in this? Who's actually committing more of the violence here? So there's, there's no, can I just say that there's no threat if, if they've been lying about aspects of their nuclear technology for a long time? We have nuclear weapons in England. Are I we a threat? I, did, I, I didn't say. You know, we Israel have has nuclear not. weapons. I said they, they, definitely I said they were, li I, they um, were um, lying um, about aspects of what they've done. Okay, uh, um, that's not, that's not a threat. Um, well, I don't know whether they're lying or they're not lying. I haven't been in there. Uh, but at the end of the day... Well, when the Atomic Energy Agency Iraq, has, and they've said Iraq that they've been lying. Iraq was supposedly lying. had weapons of mass destruction. We invaded their country saying, you've got weapons of mass destruction. There were no weapons of mass destruction. So then we said, oh, we're here to create democracy and regime change. Well... Mm -hmm. I mean, just to mix things up a bit, I have to say on this point I disagree slightly with my partner. I do think Iran can be considered, is a threat actually, but they're a threat not because they're Islamists, but because they're trying to get nuclear weapons and they're acting as an irresponsible power. It has nothing to do necessarily with their Islamism. Okay. It's that they have a very aggressive agenda well, in the region. Just, just to make an example, unfortunately, their position on the legitimacy of pluralism in faith for concerns even the Jews is something that has no possibility of any legitimacy for concerns Islamic principles and for concerns the, the, the natural uh, culture of coexistence and pluralism and respect of diversity in faith in Europe. So this is a threat because at the end of the day, they are starting to have the monopole of the Islamic uh, uh, leadership. They would like to, and they want to export it to the West because they do not have legitimacy in the East. And uh, at the end of the day, they will try to uh, even have the legitimacy of belief. And so, uh, uh, and so all the mainstream Muslims, all the, all the great scholars of Islam in contemporary society, all the believers in Christianity and, and Judaism, and all the non-believers will be all out uh, because we will be discriminated because they, uh, they are. If you, if you're not sure that they are, they are a threat, don't take the risk because you cannot be naive in, in, the, in, 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 uh, in putting at, uh, at the same place the possibility of a true participation of believers in Islam into the political debate and of false persons that are trying to use religion not for peace and okay. not for spirituality. All right. Okay, I'm going to take a question from the lady up there. Um, my, my name is Shweta Sitaraman. I'm Indian by nationality, but I've lived in the Middle East all my life. I'm not a Muslim, uh, but my question is for the proposition. The key word here is Islam. Political anything could be a threat to anything else. My question is, why is political Islam? What are the, what are the, what are the, the areas, the, the key factors in Islam, political Islam that are a threat? Are people using political Islam as an excuse for their actions? Or are they actually practicing political Islam as threats to the Western society? There are, there are two options. Uh, Muslims are participating and have the duty and the responsibility and the freedom to engage into the contribution for the political uh, development of society in the East and in the West. So this is the, the translation of a correct approach in intention, methodology and goal of a Muslim believer in politics. The, uh, uh, the, the difference, the great difference is that uh, on the other side you have an ideology that is using, uh, using political uh, purposes uh, that have nothing to do with religion and that at the end of the day they, are going to, they, they want to threaten the established system of, of democracy and of freedom and even within the, the, the Muslims in order to change the, the, because they okay, believe that okay, Islam let me is the just solution. Go back to the, let me just go back. I want to go back to the question of these and just ask how, whether she's convinced. What is it about Islam that's threatening the West to such a great extent nothing, that we feel like nothing. it's important to debate about it? Islam is not threatening the West. 